We're here. We're alive. We're alive. Last session of the day. Jake, day two. Right, well, um, thanks everyone for making it here. I'm getting up at 5 a.m. and then hiking back up the, uh, the hill from Malos to <laughs> listen to this session on, on um, Jit Watch. Uh, the aim of this session is uh, basically to um, understand that more or less the, the VM does a good job of optimizing most Java code and um, lets you get away with writing idiomatic Java. You don't have to worry about writing really ugly code to get the decent performance from the VM. But there are a few failure modes, um, and we're going to look at some examples uh, and look at uh, where, where the VM succeeds uh, and sometimes where it doesn't. So um, I want this to be sort of um, very question and answer. I've got a few examples, but feel free to interrupt at any time. I've only got a few slides. Um, okay, I'll, I'll quickly talk about JetWatch. If you want to take a picture of this slide, uh, if you want to uh, download the code. Uh, JetWatch is basically a tool for um, parsing the log outputs of the Java virtual machine um, in order to understand the decisions that were made by the hotspot uh, just-in-time compilers uh, as it tried to optimize your code based on, uh, um, pro based on a profile it built of what your code was doing at, uh, at one time. It's, uh, it's free, it's open source, um, so you just um, clone it from Git um, and you can use Maven or Ant uh, to build it. Uh, in order to get the log files out of the VM, you need to use a few extra switches. Uh, first is to unlock diagnostic options. Uh, you need to use the trace class loading so that JetWatch knows what your class model was. Log compilation is the main one. That causes the VM to output a usually pretty big XML file containing all of the, uh, the just-in-time um, decisions it made. And uh, if you've got the hotspot assembly binary, um, which, uh, there are instructions on the JetWatch wiki for how to uh, how to install that. You can also look at uh, disassembled native code. So every time the uh, JIT compiler compiles a method, puts in the code cache, it will also then disassemble that to produce readable assembly language. So these are a few of the things that I think we could probably talk about in this session. Um, escape analysis, that's one um, feature of the C2 compiler in the, in the virtual machine, and that can perform tasks such as heap elimination. Um, and, and lock elision, I'll get onto those in a moment. Uh, we can look at uh, lock coarsening, uh, we also look at uh, inlining and the various um, types of call sites for methods that can and can't be inlined. Uh, we might look at intrinsics, where basically the, uh, the, the best known optimization for, uh, the best known implementation of doing something is sort of baked into the VM. And um, we can look at um, what happens if you get an optimization wrong. Uh, so, what, what is a trap and what is a, a de optimization? And if we have any time, we can look at uh, perhaps some, some other languages on the VM, perhaps um, that's one. So um, heap elimination is a, a feature I've added. Um, well, he detection of heap elimination is a feature I've added recently to the tool. Um, it attempts to identify objects that don't need to be allocated on the Java heap. So within the VM, there are three categorizations uh, for objects when it's doing heap, heap elimination. The first is a no escape. This is an object which the VM has identified as not escaping the method which it was in, create, which it, in which it was created. Um, so this, this object can be allocated somewhere else other than Java heap, which means you don't have to garbage collect it, and it just simply disappears when this method's um, frame pops off the stack. Um, and this is a very useful optimization if you've got a hot loop um, that would otherwise be generating lots of objects that have a very high allocation rate and you might suffer from problems such as overflowing young generation and getting a, getting a full GC. Uh, if an object does escape the current method, i.e. It's, you, create, you create a local object but you then pass it off to another method as an argument, um, it can't be heap eliminated. But there's still an optimization which escape analysis can perform and that is uh, it can um, elide the locks. If there are any locks associated with that, then the locks can be eliminated simply because if a local object is created on a thread, um, then if the, if the VM can identify that as not being used by any other threads, then that lock can be elided. Uh, finally, objects which um, do escape the method or access by other threads are classed as global escape, and there's no optimizations that can be made here. Uh, so they're allocated on the heap and have to be GC'd at the end of their life. Um, so uh, it's very much been a, a learning process for me. I've uh, asked some questions on Hotspot Compiler Dev, and um, a useful answer I've got back from, from Vladimir Ivanov, uh, paraphrased, was 
Um, when hotspot eliminates allocations on the heap, it doesn't allocate them onto the, stock, onto the stack in the traditional sense. What it does is uh, it sort of explodes the object into its fields. Those fields are treated as local variables and passed to the register allocator. Uh, the register allocator is part of the virtual machine, which can then decide, can it um, take these um, exploded local fields, can it fit them into registers on the CPU? Uh, if it can't, if there are too many, then what can it do? It can um, spill those onto the, onto the stack. So, examples. So here's the, uh, here's the Chipwatch program. I'll just open up the, uh, the sandbox. So let's go through my first example here. Um, this is an escape analysis test. I've got, uh, I've got two objects here, both of which just wrap an int. Um, these objects are unrelated in the class hierarchy. Um, wrapper one object can, has an equals method which um, accepts uh, wrapper two. And this is to test um, Argoscape. So the, uh, the, the body of the method is basically a loop which runs a large number of times and within this loop, I'm um, creating instances of wrap on and wrapper two. So you'd think if you didn't know about um, heap elimination, you'd, um, you'd be creating 100 million wrapper ones, 100 million wrapper twos, and you'd have to go to collect those. So let me now run this. If you've not used the sandbox before, it's a way we can you can um, write some code and then have that code um, compiled into class files and execute those class files with all of the uh, logging options that JitWatch requires, um, and then JitWatch passes the output and, uh, and uh, analyzes the, the results. Um, I'll just turn to the assembly view for now. Uh, so what we've got here is JitWatch has uh, identified that this, uh, this uh, instantiation here of wrapper one object doesn't escape the method. All it's done is it's um, looked at the hotspot log, and part of the log has told us this object um, escaped the method, that didn't escape the method, and has been um, not allocated on the heap. And same as this one here. So wrapper one and wrapper two, neither of them escaped the method, so they've both been allocated somewhere else other than the heap. So no garbage was was generated. So let's move on to another example. So that was with a uh, that was with a wrapper object containing a primitive. Here's one containing a string, just to see if heap elimination can work there. Uh, right, uh, no, the, the strike through is the strike through is, is the jet watch um, annotation for an eliminated object. So, yet again, yes, it contains strings, so it's not just limited to, to primitives. The hotspot log has told jet watch that uh, in this case, even though these strings were created, none of these were allocated on the heap either. So, um, try another example. This one, we've got a, a, a wrap, the wrapper objects contain multiple primitive fields. So, if I run that, Then, yep, uh, heap elimination is still working, so neither of these wrapper objects have been allocated on the heap. So, um, I'm going to push this as far as it can go. Wrapper uh, objects, both containing 20 uh, primitive fields. Execute that, and uh, heap elimination has still worked. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. Actually, just to prove this works, ah, oh, now I'm on a tiny font, how can I? Right, so I've got a script here, so if I run um, this exact same class, escape, test many fields, um, there's no, um, this, uh, this script has the host GC turned on, so um, nothing nothing was, was, was logged. If I now run it without escape analysis, so I've turned off escape analysis using VM switch um, minus do escape analysis. And uh, you can see the, the garbage collector's got a lot to do. So that's just uh, an example to, 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 to demonstrate that that is working. Right, so can we go back to the chip watch? And uh, we can do a test with, uh, with an unboxing. Yes, the, uh, the allocation of this, this integer object here has been eliminated according to, according to the log file. And actually, if I just go back to the first one. Um, now, wrapper one object uh, quite clearly doesn't escape the method. 
that wrapper 2 looks like it's actually being passed to um, the equals method on wrapper 1, so it does appear that the, the second wrapper object is leaving the method, so you think um, this probably isn't going to be a no escape, so it's not going to benefit from heap elimination. Thankfully, another feature of the VM is inlining. So I can see here that uh, it's a little bit small, but both of these, um, both, both constructions of these wrap objects were inlined. Jibosh can show you that both of those constructors uh, were, were inlined, so yes, the, uh, the constructions were inlined, therefore Rapid2 didn't actually escape the method, therefore it was successfully uh, heap eliminated. Okay, back to the presentation. So, um, some questions which I have are, um, what, what are the limits of, of heap elimination? Uh, what kind of objects can't be, can't be heap eliminated? Um, one of our collections, objects with, with deep graphs, and uh, what's the actual cost of using the register allocator versus, versus using the heap? So I'll throw that out there to any, uh, any VM engineers. What's complicated? It's complicated. Okay. Are, 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 there any, are, are there any ballpark rules on, on what can and can't um, benefit from heap elimination? Is it to do with the, the, the number of the number of fields in the object, or is there, is there, is there a limit to which that it can spill onto the stack? There, there is a lot of the safety code, but I hope it's, it's enabled in the online. I hope it's an ordinary Okay. Some, there's, there's some additional enhancements to heap elimination um, coming in future, in future JDKs. Um, another feature which uh, escape analysis can um, uh, can produce is this called lock, lock elision. Basically, this is um, can locks be eliminated if the object is determined um, thread local. Um, examples for that might be things like um, string buffers and vectors, which are um, synchronized objects, but quite often used in a in a thread local manner. There's also um, uh, lock coarsening is a, is a different kind of optimization made by the VM, not based on escape analysis. But uh, lock coarsening is where you have two synchronized regions um, locking on the same object with um, other code in, in, in between. Um, and the optimization is to enlarge the synchronized region to only have one lock if no meaningful uh, operations occur in between. Now, I don't have no idea what the uh, definition of uh, meaningful here is in this. Uh, in this instance, but um, I guess through, through trial and error, we could probably work out um, uh, how much code you have to write between the two synchronized regions before the, the lock coarsening uh, doesn't happen. So we'll go back to the example. Right. So here, uh, I've got some code with um, two synchronized blocks synchronizing on this um, with, a, with a local variable being modified uh, in between. And if I scroll down, then uh, the log has told us that um, one of the uh, monitor enters, one of the synchronized blocks has been eliminated. Um, now, I'm not actually sure if the, uh, if, if, if the first synchronized block was, was eliminated either. If I look at... Um, Sandbox log and look for eliminations. There are actually two eliminations in the log, uh, but if I add some context, then only one of those eliminations actually um, identifies a bytecode index. So it might be that this is a uh, log compilation bug in the VM, and that both log logs were eliminated. Logs were eliminated, or it might just be only the second was. But I'll do some um, investigation into that and try and work out uh, if, if both of those logs were were taken out. So back to this. 
um, another example of a lock being eliminated is uh, I've got a loop here with a, a synchronized block on the object um, and within the, the loop I'm calling two more synchronized methods um, if those are inlined then what we'll effectively have is nested um, synchronized blocks on the same object so we'll see what the VM does here right now um, because it's an invoke virtual I've not done the strike through because that would be confusing as to whether or not the method was um, not called, but I've added um, extra information to the tooltip, so it says here a lock has been eliminated on the, the synchronized method that was called and on this one here. So, you gave me a list of the things in that book, you invented yourself for a method that you can get before and after. I'm not going to watch this with the reverse of the mirror again, I'm going to watch this with the code figures that are. This is, this is just, just working on lock compilation. So, this, if I look at um, Okay, if I just grab for eliminations here as well, then what I see is, is yeah, so the logs basically told me where, where the eliminations happened. <laughs> um, okay, so I thought, um, let's, let's have a try at um, the string buffer, see what, uh, see what happens there. So what I've got here is, um, a loop here which basically um, calls another method which joins some strings together and then appends it to another string buffer. And in this case there have been no, um, no locks eliminated. Now I'll confirm that by going to the XML. There are no locks at all being eliminated around the string buffer. Um, being called in a, in a tight loop, um, even though it's uh, thread, even though it's uh, method local. Uh, anyone have any ideas why that might be? I'll just show the code. I think that one needs a little bit of uh, further investigation. I did actually find a blog post uh, where someone else was trying to uh, work out if. Um, Lock Elision was working on a string buffer and again wasn't able to uh, produce that. What if, what if your concatenation method would just do string concatenation without string buffer? Because it seems like you have string buffer and then calling in and method also has string buffer. Maybe that somehow has anything to do with that. Yeah, yeah perhaps. It's a different instance for sure. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I can, we can try that very quickly if I just uh, replace this code with. Build anyways. Okay, so let's see what's happened here. Um, there's no indication that anything's been eliminated. If maybe, I look in. maybe this is another bug in the compilation, and the, 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 the lock is really eliminated. You need to look at the, the assembly to see if you look at some. Yes, yeah, it might be worth looking at, uh, looking at the actual assembly code as well for this. This, that there's no reason why that lock should not be eliminated in the first case. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, all of our tests is there that the a lock was eliminated. Yeah. It's string. Okay. Yeah, string buffer. I not know, six, know. but certainly yeah. seven. But perhaps it was so clever to not generate lock in the first place, that because there is no elimination. There's okay. No all right. But I'm um, just, you know, super guessing. <laughs> Can you super guess? Yes, yeah. We can go back to the assembly for this we one. Need to, to Oh uh, yes, this is Java 51. <laughs> so George, look at it for. Can look at the assembly for this. That sounds like a good hashtag. <laughs> okay, so this is the assembly code for um, this method here, concat pieces, which basically takes three strings and um, concatenates them with a plus operator. Uh, yeah, with, with, with plus print assembly. Yes. Okay, well, I 
can't see any I can't see any locks in there. I can't see any locks. Look look at the buffer that happened. On this tune with a riser on the cat pieces. Yes. For me, that's it. Next line. No, I can't do that. Oh, with a apple. Next line. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's here. That's the part right there. So, do you know? Yeah, that's the part there. So, so my question is, is this assembly like the first pass of the compiler, or is it like after warm up, or is what assembly is this? Uh, this? This assembly is when the C2 compiler has uh, JIT compiled the bytecode into native code and uh, put it into the code cache. So it's, it's like the first pass? It's a final no further optimization after we're marking? Um, don't believe so. Yeah, yeah, yes. That actually is not. Uh, yeah, the, the, okay, so the lock for the. Because it's, a, it's a using the keyword, right? So it actually mm. doesn't show up for the bytecode this way. Yeah, no. no. No, it's in the implementation of the string buffer. Right. When you call happen, the synchronization. Right, okay, so, so in that case, I'll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll go into the end, so this is the. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you're right. It's, you're absolutely right. Okay, so I will go into this, this end. Right, so this is, the, this is the assembly code for string buffer. So here's the synchronization entry. Well, there it is, your synchronization So it's not been eliminated at all. But in our test, that's Okay. Okay. Um, I've got another example with a with a vector, but uh, I found I found the same behaviour as as well. Uh, there was no evidence that any locks were eliminated. Another class you're not supposed to use anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, this, those optimizations are meant for this. Right, so. <laughs> those optimizations? No. Oh. I'm pretty sure they, they have something like if vector. No, so if nothing, nothing was limited to there with a vector either. They're not, they're not supposed to use it. Um, well, I think the, the, the way to find out why is to um, make some additions to. The, 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 this, this path open JDK. I've spoken with um, some guys in Hotspot Compiler Dev and they seem fairly um, receptive to uh, additional log compilation. I think once you've turned on log compilation, you've made a decision that um, you're, you're, you're not worried about the performance impact of log compilation. Chris, and also log coarsening doesn't apply because you're in the loop, right? You cannot course it around the loop. That's right, yes. The, the, yes. This, this would be more of a, a, a this, in this instance, I was hoping to get a lock elision. Um, lock coarsening um, doesn't uh, apply to, you can't widen the lock to include a, a loop according to the, uh, according to the Oracle docs. You can't widen the lock to. You can't coarsen a, a, a lock to include a loop according to the, uh, according to the documentation on the uh, Oracle website. I think, I think they're worried about safe points. I've also got a few examples of some other um, some other instances of what you can do with do with JitWatch. Um, in this case, you might want to do that because you don't want to take the cache hit on the branch back. Right. Okay. If you make the loop big enough, you might end up with a cache mess on the instruction mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is an example of um, how JitWatch can very simply inline a method. This method is, is called large number of times within a loop. Um, and if I look at the compile chain, then yes, that was uh, quite simply inlined into its parent. And I've used a magic number here, um, 99, which is 63 in hex, so I should be able to locate that in the assembly. Unless actually Hotspot's got uh, too clever for me in this example and worked out exactly what I was trying to do and just um, done it all as a, a multiplier. I need, to put a, uh, I need to put a search feature on the assembly, I think, to uh, pick out things that you're looking for. Recently, um, a, a 
a guy on uh, Twitter called Nathan Tippy posted some, some interesting examples of um, branchless um, branchless uh, optimizations in Java. So how, how to how to avoid branch instructions. Um, I have exactly the same Java code. Obviously, this code is a little bit um, harder to read than this code here. Uh, the logic of this is if x and y are equal, return a, otherwise return b and pass in four arguments. So if I run this code here, and I look at the, uh, if I look at the assembly for, i turn off the bytecode, look at the assembly for this implementation, then there's, there's no jumps, no branches. If I look at the uh, traditional uh, idiomatic Java, then we've got a, I've got a compare and a, and a journey. And uh, another example here, if A is less than zero, um, return B, otherwise return A. Again, it's all been done with, um, with shifts and uh, arithmetic operations, um, whereas the traditional Java, you've got tests and jumps. One thing I've added fairly recently is support for uh, for NAS one in um, in JitWatch. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here we've got a very simple piece of uh, piece of JavaScript. We've got a, a for loop um, calling a couple of um, functions, and each of those functions calls another function. <laughs> yes, um, JitWatch doesn't work particularly well with optimistic stick typing um, enabled. But um, I mean, what, what is uh, quite interesting is um, basically looking at the bytecode that's produced for, a, for, a, um, for an, an invoked dynamic language. Um, it's absolutely nothing like the bytecode you get um, for languages which have the concept of a, a method which maps fairly closely to a, to a, a method invoked on the, on the JVM. So we've got lots of, um, lots of uh, calls to invoke dynamic. Could you, um, could you or Attila give me such a, a very, um, very high level um, description of how uh, functions in JavaScript do actually end up um, on, in, in, in the VM? Slow mode and set the property 
indirectly the whole JavaScript logic associated to it. So our best world, uh, best case scenario is that whatever you link with Invoke Dynamic remains like that forever. And then worst case, you have a guard and uh, a field access or a early book static, basically below it. Okay. So it's, it's used to add extra link logic. Okay. Um, how does uh, how, how does using the invoke dynamic um, affect use of uncommon traps? Is that uh, done sim in similar ways to? Um, Alex, you should be here to answer that. But uh, uncommon traps are used to splice, uh, like put endpoints to different paths on the JIT experience. So you'll see more of them if if you have polymorphism. Okay. I can take a quick look in the. Uh, we had to do some pruning because we had uh, we had a lot of uh, byte code issues or code length issues that prevented inlining just because we started using evoke dynamics or specific JIT work to, to be more incremental, less byte code dependent below the surface because uh, the execute code mass as a function of byte code is very different when it comes to evoke dynamic rich code and when it comes to basically serialized Java to byte code. So the JIT, all the JIT has known for 20 years is how to compile Java efficiently and we had so many different patterns. So, uh, especially Rome, Australia, and Vladimir Ivana, and those guys have done a lot of great work in C2 to be more flexible when it comes to bytecode to make the code. Mm -hmm. okay. C2IR is very uh, low level, even the highest tier, which is not such a good idea. So, you know, like memory access, you know, the highest tier of the IR. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, certainly just looking at the, um, what we call the JIT journal, which is grouping together all the tags for. <laughs> Um, a, a, a particular piece of um, the, the, the bytecode. Um, this is um, probably 100 times bigger than what you might expect for the equivalent Java code. The amount of uh, log compilation XML uh, describing the, the decisions made by the uh, by the VM. So if I have a quick look in the uh, for eliminations. Um, Okay, well, there was, there was um, something was not able to be um, eliminated by a scope analysis, but I can't really tell what that is because uh, the bytecode index is zero. But it looks like um, uh, now someone can benefit from uh, heap elimination as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Bo boxing is one of our uh, main enemies because you have a lot of implicit boxing in the method handles library. We just weave method handles through the GDK, through the Java and Java package. And Implicitly, a lot of these methods take objects <coughs> or polymorphic signatures, and so you get a lot of boxing out of behind the scenes that the VM doesn't eliminate. So I would say that boxing is still the main performance enemy. If we had perfect partial escape analysis in Hotspot, we would not need to even do optimistic types in Hotspot because they will be unboxed. Right, okay. But isn't that the issue that you solve this signature polymorphic or polymorphic signature in War is there the same thing? Yeah, there is the same thing, but that is a little, took a little bit specially. Uh, but when it comes to generating a standard bar model, like folding arguments, someone will do objects in the system where you can't behind the scenes, and also will suck at eliminating it. So it's gotten better, but it's still plenty of implicit objects that you didn't know were there. And that needs to be fixed if invoke dynamics is going to be efficient and like the preferred way to implement that kind of languages, because there's so much going on. Uh, with memory allocation and no control of all that can be eliminated. And invoke dynamic is call site wide, so there's really no excuse for the JIT not to be able to eliminate uh, boxes because you know the scope in that you have the calls, which is much simpler special case than generic partial escape analysis. <laughs> Still, C2 makes everything hard, C2 knows makes everything hard. <laughs> Okay, um, so thinking about um, what else could JITWatch do, um, how, how, how could it be more <coughs> useful um, for developers? I had a couple of thoughts. Could information in the log compilation output um, predict um, future performance fragility? Um, and by that I mean, um, are a lot of your methods um, guarded by biomorphic uncommon traps, i.e. Uh, you've got two implementations uh, seen at runtime. If you accidentally add another one uh, in, your, in your source code, are you going to? I mean, would that be a useful warning to, to developers that uh, um, you've already reached your your your, your inlining um, call site limit? Um, other potential um, 
hints developers are um, sort of counting up the uh, counting up the sizes of the uh, inline methods in the call chain and um, giving a developer warning. Um, if you add one more log statement to this method, you're going to you're going to blow your your inlining chain and and, and um, suffer a performance uh, loss there. Um, I'll do a little bit more work into how the um, sort of stack spills work you know, with the uh, with the register allocator. Um, maybe there's a maybe there's a limit that could be turned into a developer hint in, in some tool that says. Um, Oh, yeah, I think for that to be useful, there'd need to be some kind of logging at the moment. The production VM, there's no logging at all of what the register allocator has done, and I imagine that would be quite very robust logging because every time it's a, um, every time the, the allocator would be used. Um, but perhaps um, there's there's some way to to filter that. Would it be would it be interesting to know what the register allocator's been up to? Would it be interesting to know how what size of um, uh, fields, exploded fields, ended up on the on the stack as a spill. Um, that's an open question. Open elimination. Hmm. You've used G to watch the inlining and the prog methods in JDK. Yeah, well, sure. Yes. You fed up this information back into the OpenJDK yes. uh, uh, yes. yeah. what, what were your findings? Did any of the problems fixed? The, uh, yeah. the question was: um, I've used um, part of JetWatch, that's the, the JAR scan tool, to analyse the, uh, the runtime JARs um, and identify all of the methods which are above the, 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 the inlining limit for hot code, which is 325 bytes. Um, based on the JAR scan tool, you give it a JAR and it will um, pass the byte code um, in all of the methods of, of that JAR um, and highlight the ones that are above the, uh, the inlining limit for, for hot code, which is uh, 325 bytes. That, what that means is that if that code was to be used in um, in a hot loop, there wouldn't be any um, chance of it being um, uh, inlined. Uh, I'll say that in the general case, and there are actually exceptions to that, but uh, generally that, that code wouldn't be inlined. And um, I think there are a couple of examples of um, there are lots, lots of instances where it's, um, it's constructor code or it's, um, it's, it's, it's code which is not ever going to end up in a hot loop. But a couple of examples I found that were um, interesting were things like um, array sorting. Um, so I think the Tim sort uh, method, uh, a part of that, are, are too big to form any kind of um, useful inlining chain. And also things like um, string dot to uppercase and to lowercase, because they have to deal with all the various locales. Um, String dot to uppercase is too big to too big to be inlined, and um, because there are some character sets where by moving from an uppercase to a lowercase letter or vice versa, you change the number of characters needed to encode. So therefore, you have to have all the code to cater for resizing the the jar arrays. So there are some some interesting findings in the uh, uh, by, by um, looking at the the, the runtime jar the, the, the JDK code um, of places where perhaps the the language teams aren't, aren't aware. Of, um, of the effects of, of, of their, their source on the uh, on, on the JIT compiler. Um, obviously, uh, language teams want to um, write code with um, it's very readable. They might use a lot of assertions. Um, now, the assert keyword, most of the time, uh, by default, when you run the, the JVM assertions, are disabled. So you're not going to benefit from those assertions. They're not going to be evaluated, but they do count against your inlining um, budget. Um, and uh, there are some parts of the, uh, the JDK where, inline, where assertions are, are used heavily. One of those is um, uh, method handles. I did actually try to do some benchmarking. Um, I, I, I posted a question on Twitter, where are uh, method handles used extensively? And Alexi replied and said, uh, run Octane. Uh, run run, 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 run um, Octane on, on, on that one. So I tried that. But I actually had a lot of problems getting um, stable, um, stable results out of the benchmark. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, now the the um, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the now from reading from reading the uh, the wiki, it looks like the, uh, the official JMH um, test code is is an internal um, is an internal Oracle uh, repository. So I, I wrote my own um, JMH um, um, benchmark on benchmark. All right. Okay. Excellent. Um, but what, what I found was um, even um, I mean running on hardware that um, had um, variable clock speed turned off, nothing else in the box, bare metal, 
running for three days, uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't get any kind of stable results out of them out of running Arctane. Um, but uh, I have actually made some um, made some code changes to to OpenJDK, which I've not pushed in there yet. What they do is they modify the Java C compiler uh, to um, strip out the production assertions. So if any, any assertions in the source code uh, uh, don't end up in the bytecode, they're not translated into bytecode. Um, and it makes a, makes a reasonable difference in size uh, to some of these methods which are above the inlining limit, but I've not benchmarked them yet because I was waiting to try and get um, the Octane benchmarks table. Um, but it would be interesting to, to look at. I did uh, a while ago actually try and um, split some of the methods in, um, in the uh, array sorting to, to get different um, inlining permutations, and I was able to get about 3 or 4% improvement in sorting performance. Um, and, and that was because different, uh, different inlinings were able to be, to be made. Um, and I made a point on, on Twitter a while back, actually, by keeping methods small, um, you're actually increasing the number of permutations, um, so you increase the number of code paths which can benefit from, from inlining. But if, you, if, you, if your methods are large, then there's only one or two ways they can um, chunks will, will fit into each other. But if you break your code into a large number of smaller methods, as long as it's sensible, um, then you can benefit from um, a larger number of inline permutations. Uh, right, okay, so that's the end of um, the slides I had and, and the examples I've got. So, so not only that, you're likely to have a lot more inline permutations and then each of the inline permutations are going to be much better than optimized than if you have fewer. Mm. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, it will show you when inlining has been successful or, or has failed. I do have, actually, I do have another example I can, I can open. And it could be useful to have some of the, uh, some of the extraneous code that you have outside of JitWatch mm -hmm. that actually checks the system is actually get brought into JitWatch. Yes. Uh, so just knowing if you have uh, methods to dig for inline or, yes. or for compilation, it would be uh, just a fantastic suggestion to have. Uh, well, especially those methods are quite close to the inline budget. Yeah, yes. well, yeah, especially, <coughs> especially if those methods are on hot paths. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Um, right, okay, if I, if I, if I sort of quickly, uh, quickly write one, um, I'll use the skeleton and another simple test. I think one of the other things I can say is that from some of our benchmarking, uh, um, I wrote a, um, an article for Developer Works a while back where it was um, showing the futility of writing micro benchmarks. <laughs> that was supposed to be the, uh, uh, the point, right? And um, um, actually, I ran into some interesting results in terms of the, um, uh, what I call, uh, invariant, uh, invariance of loops that supposedly would be hoisted out of the loop. And there's some type sensitivity for these types of optimizations. So they absolutely work if you use the, the type it's designed for. But if you use a different type and you actually run the same code, um, then you don't actually get the optimization. So in this case, if the loop invariants were all ints, um, then it worked fine. As soon as you moved to long, uh, then of course uh, the loop invariant was not hoisted out of the uh, code for you know, whatever reason. You didn't actually go and investigate why um, it was so type specific. But we've seen, we've seen that in a number of different cases yeah, where optimizations will work on one type but not another. Yeah. I think um, Kit said that int uh, more optimized than long, but exactly why more optimized than long. Right, yeah. And it's probably because they're more commonly used. So they just um, stuck to the common use case in that case. That, that's one thing. The other thing I've noticed, and maybe Marcus, you can comment on this, I've noticed that the JVM behavior, uh, sorry, yeah, I've noticed that the JVM behavior is significantly different depending upon the compiler time memory the JVM actually gets laid out in when you start it up. And I thought that, that and I didn't know if you knew of what the effects of the uh, different addressing modes in each of the quadrants of memory would actually have on the 
Foxbox's ability to uh, adapt to the runtime. I think, again, Alexei is here and he can tweet this answer much better than I, but I think uh, when it comes to memory layout, uh, we didn't the new artifacts and product course. There is code, but it's not perfect. Yeah. So it, it's not code generation, but it's rather uh, memory management wise that uh, uh, locality uh, cache analysis will probably uh, be the result. Uh, I know that people have tried to, to like do micro benchmarks and say you would need runs on the server, maybe you can have a reproducer. To Rob's question, um, what you what can do at the moment is show you the, uh, the, the call chain, and if you tilt it on these, it tells you the size of each one. Um, and over here, it will actually tell you the, uh, the total size of the method after the inlining has taken place. Uh, it does color code. Anything under, if it's less than 35 bytes, it'll be green because that'll be um, automatically inlined. If it's between 35 and the, the inlining uh, limit for hot code, which is 325, it'll be amber. And if it's above, then it'll be if it's about 325 bytes, then it will, it'll be red. So, um, does it not, the decision to inline is actually done on the size of the pre inline? Um, inlining will fail, I believe, if um, the, the next candidate for inlining would, would, would um, take you above the, uh, the limit. But um, I'm sure. That's how I think it works. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 right, I think so. <laughs> okay, so I mean, what, 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 what other information would, would, would be useful to have as, as a developer from, from the VM? What, what, what other parts of the compilation um, profiling would, would, would be nice to have? Um, the, the other tool I've got is a static analysis tool, 
um, which doesn't know anything about hot parts, it just uh, looks at the jar, looks, right. looks at the jar. And they're meant to, com and yeah. they're meant to combine those? Words. Yes, yeah. Yes, um, yes, I mean, I, I guess uh, I could um, take the, uh, uh, you know, like if you, if you, when, you, when you load a log file into JitWatch, um, it identifies the classes that were used and um, where they were loaded from, so I could from there um, identify the, the jars and um, work out what uh, other associated code, which may not have actually been run, but um, was, was associated, that could be, um, that could be something I could highlight. Going forwards, um, I've, I've looked at the code for OpenJDK 9. There's actually um, a lot more. Inf there's, there's a greater level of detail on, on some of the lock compilation stuff. Um, certainly for for lock coarsening uh, um, and lock elision, there's a much greater level of detail available in the lock compilation output from JDK 9. So the um, the, the VM team are working on um, sort of making making this more serviceable. So that's something I can pick up in in, in JetWatch for Java 9. There should be a greater level of detail available for things like locks. Um, yeah, plus, as I said, they're, they're fairly receptive to um, suggestions for improvements. So, if, if, there's, if there's anything anyone knows that happens in the VM that will be a, a useful event um, coming out and, and visualised, then, then please um, either um, sort of ping me on Twitter or drop it on the, uh, the JetWatch um, Google group.